uh, they have achieved, they, they have established their scientific career and also their, uh, uh, their role in the physics community. Well, this first half is the most of the an old friend of mine, a, 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 a extraordinary physicist and a deep human personality that uh, I happen to know much beyond our uh, actual scientific collaborations. Uh, his cute personality uh, allows me to understand the problem deeply and then always uh, 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 give a wise word in uh, any aspect uh, that can enrich human personality. It is with great pleasure that uh, I open this first half of the So let's now turn to the scientific part of the, of the uh, session. And here also I would like to say that I have a feeling of deja vu. Uh, it's not the first time that I'm here and uh, hearing Nati Cyber coming back to this country and giving a lecture that opens new fields uh, and gives enthusiasm of new uh, things. I remember things in the, uh, in the 90s where he gave a talk in a winter school, I believe, uh, in, in which the, this uh, fundamental contribution to the duality in his theory was presented, and today he will uh, speak to us of some uh, <coughs> new ideas that uh, uh, propose that our physics uh, is related to a metastable supersymmetric breaking uh, vacuum uh, in a theory that uh, continues to be supersymmetric in its, in its fully ground state, thus avoiding uh, noble theorems and many obstacles that a real supersymmetric breaking Nati. Yeah. Thank you. The previous speaker was long enough, so it would be around the same. Well, <laughs> first, I'd like to start by expressing my deepest sincere condolences to Eliezer, for the loss of his brother. The birthday celebration would take place as planned, and he said life must go on. So I would like to congratulate Eliezer and Shimon with a very warm and happy birthday. In addition to their, Shimon and Eliezer have made important and fundamental scientific discoveries which have had tremendous and far-reaching impact. In addition to their research, they've also educated and nurtured several generations of younger physicists. Some of them are here today with us. And through their administrative efforts, they have advanced the high level of academics in Israel. We came here today to celebrate their 60th birthday, to thank them for their endless efforts and to salute to their success. But this is a much larger celebration. Shimon and Eliezer personify Israeli science, and in particular the Israeli theoretical high energy physics community. Therefore, this is not only a celebration of Shimon and Eliezer, but a celebration of Israeli physics, and more generally a celebration of Israeli academic community. The long and impressive list of people who have gathered here today demonstrates how much Shimon's and Eliezer's efforts are appreciated. It also testifies to the respect of the world to Israel's universities. As we congratulate Eliezer and Shimon on their birthday, we can say, as is common in Hebrew, let you live to 120. But since they already have 120 years, we should really congratulate them to 240. Okay, so happy birthday. So I was asked by the organizers I was asked by the organizers to start with some more elementary comments, uh, which would be approachable to a wider audience, and only later become more technical. So as the talk progresses, I will gradually become more and more technical. Also, some people had problems with the laptops here. And since I managed to get mine to work here with the wireless, I will, if you want, I can have a demonstration how to connect to the wireless, but I do that only after my talk. <laughs> so I'll talk here about a topic which is, in some sense, analytic continuation of the work that Daniele described here about supersymmetry breaking. I'll talk about three recent papers I wrote with various co-authors. Some people figured it out already. <laughs> People did with various co-authors. 
and also mention some other contributions throughout my talk. The important thing that I think all of us should face now is that the LHC is right around the corner. And the first question we should ask, what will the LHC find? This is really a very interesting and very exciting period. For one thing, I've been in this field for about 30 years, and they have, I think it's fair to say that there has not been, it's almost fair to say that there has not been a single really surprising experimental discovery during my entire physics career. But I think that this can change, and this can change in the near future, so I think we should really gear up to this exciting period. <coughs> So what will the LHC find? So I have them here on menu of possibilities. First, I should stress that we really don't know. Whoever tells you with certainty what will be found doesn't really know what he's talking about. Perhaps nothing. That will really be very exciting, because this will tell us that the standard model is wrong, and therefore quantum mechanics or special relativity are wrong. Something is fundamentally wrong. It will be very exciting, but I doubt this will happen. So let's not put our money here. This is the worst possibility find only the Higgs particle. This would be the most boring. It would be unnatural. It would tell us that over the last few several years when various ideas were entertained, they were completely, bark we were barking off the on the wrong tree. But it will, might also mean that the universe is anthropic. I'll find that very depressing. A slightly more exciting possibility, and now I'm going into things which are more and more likely in my list is that the, uni the universe is still unnatural, maybe anthropic, but there will be some more phy new physics that will be discovered at the LHC, for example, split supersymmetry. That's much more interesting, much more likely that the world is natural, and we were not completely misguided over the last several years. Maybe supersymmetry will be discovered, extra dimensions, and so forth. And going down through the list, things which are more and more probable, if I had to bet, I would bet on none of the above. <laughs> but given the options that are here, in my view, supersymmetry is by far the most likely thing that can happen among the things that have been presented. So for the rest of this talk, I'll focus on this possibility. It's clearly the most conservative, most conventional possibility. And in particular, it pre predicts many new particles, the superpartners of the particles we know about. And hopefully, they will be discovered at the LHC. This will be extremely exciting. But supersymmetry must be broken. The particles we know about have their masses. The superpartners are heavier. They don't have the same mass, so supersymmetry should be broken. And the question of supersymmetry breaking is a very interesting question. Many people have spent their careers on that problem. And I'll talk about that. That's a question which is really a very pragmatic relevance, because once the LHC turns on, if they find the superpartners, whatever superpartners they find, whatever masses these superpartners have, these partner masses of particles, their coupling constants, will tell us something about shorter distance physics, about how supersymmetry is broken, and in particular, even more so, how supersymmetry breaking is mediated or fed into the observed particles. So we should really be gearing up and thinking about that so that once the data is available, we know what to compare with. So today, I'll focus on supersymmetry breaking. This will be the topic of the talk. Now, it's really important to emphasize, especially to people who do particle physics and study the MSSM, that this breaking that I'm talking about is spontaneous breaking. The MSSM have hundreds, more than 100 parameters, which are explicit breaking of supersymmetry. But I'll be talking here about spontaneous breaking of supersymmetry, which will eventually lead us to computable numbers, which are all these explicit breaking. So the Lagrangian is supersymmetric. This is the first line. But the ground state is not. And supersymmetry is broken if and only if the ground state energy is non-zero. So here is the potential. The potential, if the minimum of the potential is above zero, supersymmetry is broken. If the minimum of the potential is at zero, supersymmetry is unbroken. So the theory is supersymmetric, but the ground state is not. Should add parenthetically here, that there is a closely related object, which is the vacuum energy or the cosmological constant. The cosmological constant should not be confused with the order parameter for supersymmetry breaking. Super, the, I will be talking about global supersymmetry, turning off gravity for the rest of this talk, except a few comments later on. So more specifically, let's assume that there are no gauge fields to make life simple. 
So supersymmetry, the supersymmetric theory is characterized by a holomorphic function. It's actually a section. It's called the superpotential. And supersymmetry is broken if and only if W does not have stationary points. So it's very simple. We have a function, W. It's a function of various fields. It's a holomorphic function, locally holomorphic. And we look for solutions, stationary points. The, the derivative of W in all possible directions is 0. And supersymmetry is broken if and only if we can't solve these equations. Furthermore, we would like supersymmetry breaking to be small. What do we mean by that? The natural scaling problem is the Planck scale. That's very high. We would like the scale of supersymmetry breaking to be somewhere in the TeV or 100 TeV, you know, 1,000 TeV, depending on your model. It must, must be much smaller than the Planck scale. So if we have some cutoff in the theory, M cutoff, which we can think of as being the Planck scale, we would like M SUSY, the scale of supersymmetry breaking, to be much smaller than M cutoff. And we would like to achieve that in a natural way. And I know of only one way of doing it. This is the only one way to get small numbers, and that's putting a very small number by putting a small but not very small number in the exponent. So e to the minus 1 over g square is a very small number. And this is how we can get very low scale for supersymmetry breaking. And we'll call it dynamical supersymmetry breaking. Dynamical because there is some gauge theory. It has some non interesting non-perturbative effect. It's naturally small. And thus, it generates a scale which is much smaller than the cutoff in a natural way. Let's go back to these equations we wanted to solve. We have a function w, function of n variables, chiral fields phi i. And we're looking for solutions of this equation. So even without knowing what w is, we can immediately see that it's not going to be easy to break supersymmetry. Because here we have n equations. And this is a function of n unknown. So if the function is generic, we are going to be able to solve the equation, maybe find more than one solution. And this is really the heart of the problem of why it is so hard to break supersymmetry. Because we have n equations with n unknowns, so we typically have solutions. Notice that if there is some global symmetry, that the w does not depend on n variables, but say only on n minus 1, because there's some symmetry in the problem, that doesn't help. Because then these are n minus 1 equations with n minus 1 unknowns, so it's equally hard to solve. Okay, it's equally hard to break supersymmetry or equally easy to satisfy the equations. There's only one way out that I know about, and that is assuming that the theory has an R symmetry. An R symmetry, so let it have fields phi i with charges Ri. The superpotential W should have R charge 2, so it's very easy to write the most general superpotential. We just pick one of the fields, say phi 1, and raise it to a power 2 over R1. R1 is the charge of phi 1. So this object now has R charge 2. And now we have to put anything here which has vanishing R charge. So we take off the, the n fields. We cons construct these combinations, phi i over phi 1 to the R i over R 1. So the charge of this thing in the denominator here is exactly R i, so that this whole combination is neutral. So this is the most general superpotential we can have, such that it has R charge 2 and it respects the symmetries. But now we are in business. Because if we look at this equation, now we have n, min n equations with n minus 1 unknowns. And therefore, we can solve the equations. So, sorry. And therefore, typically, we cannot find a solution. There's a little bit of fine print here. Because there's also a possibility that phi 1 is 0. But then this change of variables is singular. So we need to work a little bit harder. But let me ignore this subtlety. So we learned from here that supersymmetry is broken if and only if the problem has an R symmetry. And that's a much, much easier way to understand how to break supersymmetry. So again, assuming that, super, that W is a generic function, that's one assumption. And there was also some, mine, some fine print, which I put in a smaller font here. And then supersymmetry is broken if and only if the theory has a global R symmetry. Now, this result applies also if we have gauge dynamics. And the situation is much more complicated. And we have some non-perturbative effect. This rule still applies. One intuitive way to understand that is that we can often describe the low energy dynamics by a theory with which supersymmetry is broken by such a superpotential. So this has been a very useful guideline, looking for examples of models that break supersymmetry. <coughs> Instead of doing complicated dynamics, the first criterion is, is there an R symmetry? There is no R symmetry. Forget it, supersymmetry is not broken. There is an R symmetry. You have to work a little bit harder. But then typically, supersymmetry is broken. 
Imagine the model is slightly more complicated and it has an approximate R symmetry. What does it mean to have an approximate R symmetry? We have a small parameter in the problem, epsilon, such that when we set epsilon to zero, the problem has an R symmetry. So let's first examine what happens when epsilon is equal to exactly zero. Now we have an R symmetry. And the previous problem, the previous discussion tells us that supersymmetry is spontaneously broken. So we have a potential which looks roughly like that. It has some minimum at some point, And the minimum is above zero because supersymmetry is broken. So using the previous result, when epsilon is zero, supersymmetry is broken. Now let's turn on epsilon. As we turn on epsilon, not much is changing around here because epsilon is small, say 10 to the minus 100. It's very small. It doesn't affect anything here. But the full problem does now no longer has an R symmetry because epsilon is non-zero. Again, using the previous result, now supersymmetry is unbroken. Indeed, somewhere very far in field space, where this distance is of order 1 over epsilon, a supersymmetric state appears. As we turn off epsilon, this state will shoot off to infinity. But this is almost as good as breaking supersymmetry. Because this problem, strictly speaking, doesn't break supersymmetry because it has a supersymmetric ground state. But it has a metastable state here in which supersymmetry is spontaneously broken. So that might look like a contrived thing to do, but it's actually very natural. And as we will see in the rest of the talk, it's very common and it happens all over the place. So Steve Shanker asked me, told me always to look for slogans. The slogan before was kind of a way to summarize the understanding in as few words as possible. So the slogan before was supersymmetry is broken if and only if there is an R symmetry. And the improved slogan is supersymmetry is broken in a metastable state if and only if there is an approximate R symmetry. So now it's very easy. All we need to do is look for approximate R symmetry. Let's, look, let's step back and ask, look for dynamical supersymmetry breaking. Theories which spontaneously break supersymmetry through some dynamics, which is interesting and complicated. So in the past, it was very difficult. And there were basically two constraints that made it hard. Constraint number one was the Witten index, which was designed really in order to solve precisely this problem. Look for models that spontaneously break supersymmetry. That was the motivation behind the Witten index. And that told us that if we take a garden variety field theory, in which matter is in the vector representations. These are the most common gauge theories that we have. The typical theory of this kind does not break supersymmetry. In fact, every theory of this kind does not break supersymmetry. So that killed most likely possibilities to break supersymmetry in all the models in the market uh, at the time, which was the early 80s. The second constraint was this business of the asymmetry. I gave the modern perspective of that, but that was also understood in the 80s. And that killed a lot of the other path candidates for breaking supersymmetry. So these two criteria really made supersymmetry breaking very, very hard. And many of us believe that even though there are a few examples, as I mentioned here, a few theories do break supersymmetry, many of us believe that the theory that breaks supersymmetry is very special. And once we find one example that breaks supersymmetry, we'll calculate all the soft terms, and it will be obvious that this is the right theory because there aren't any others. So this is really very depressing, because on one hand, we can't find a single example. But even if we found one, it would not be obvious how it would be true. The situation changes if we consider metastable supersymmetry breaking. The idea of that the universe is metastable goes back to the 70s and perhaps even earlier than that. The earliest paper I found for supersymmetry breaking in a metastable state goes back to 82, and perhaps even earlier than that. So nobody in this room should get any credit for this. This is actually an interesting comment that happened in the mid-90s. Dine and Nelson and various collaborators, some of them are in this room, found models of supersymmetry breaking. But unfortunately, all these in all these models, supersymmetry was broken in a metastable state. In other words, there was some sector in the theory that breaks supersymmetry. And that sector had a stable supersymmetric ground state. But once you couple that to the standard model through messengers and other particles and so forth, the supersymmetry breaking was no longer robust. And supersymmetry was restored somewhere in field space. 
At the time, people made two comments about that. Number one, yes, it's true that the model we found is only in a metastable state, but if we only worked a little bit harder and we found some more in, in, inventive, more creative ideas, just change the gauge group, change the representations and so forth, maybe you can do better. And the good news was that even if it's metastable, if it's long-lived, it's not a big deal. Maybe that's what the universe is. At the time, I thought it was disgusting. But I still do. <laughs> but now I'm going to argue that metastable supersymmetry breaking is not some kind of a nuisance that perhaps with better ideas we can overcome. I'm going to argue that, in fact, it is inevitable. And every model of supersymmetry breaking that agrees with basic phenomenology must be metastable. So I'm going to argue that within some rather large class of examples, we live in a metastable state. And the fact that these seminal papers in the mid-90s found that we live examples with metastable states, it's not because they were not in clever enough to figure out the right example. It's because it is really inevitable and there is no alternative to that. So how does the reasoning go? As I said, for breaking supersymmetry, we need an R symmetry. But on the other hand, we know that there are gay genome masses. Gay genome masses tell us that the R symmetry should be broken. This breaking could be either explicit or spontaneous. If the R symmetry is spontaneously broken, there is a massless Goldstone boson, which is already ruled out. There might be some windows where it's OK. So the R symmetry should be explicitly broken. That's the key fact. In the universe, we do not have an exact, perhaps spontaneously broken, U1 R symmetry. Oops. <coughs> that Gabby effects typically break the R symmetry. There are two arguments for that. One is that there are no global symmetries, no global continuous symmetries in gravity. And in particular, the term in gravity, which cancels the cosmological constant, breaks the R symmetry. So such a term can lift the Goldstone boson, give it a mass, and it might be OK. But for low scale breaking, it doesn't work. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to ignore gravity. So we are in this situation that regardless of which model we have, we must have an R symmetry in order to break supersymmetry. And we must explicitly break the R symmetry in order to agree with basic phenomenology. And basic <coughs> phenomenology is just the statement that the gay genos have masses and there is no massless Goldstone boson. Now, forget the details of what the gay genos are. Kind of very general considerations tell us that there is no global continuous R symmetry which is in contradiction with our requirement to break supersymmetry. So the asymmetry must be explicitly broken. And therefore, in the absence of gravity, we must live in a metastable state. And this cartoon that I had before of what happens with approximate supersymmetry, with approximate asymmetry, which, as I said, is equivalent to metastable supersymmetry breaking, is really inevitable. So we conclude and some mild assumptions that we live in a metastable state. First, this is in accord with all known realistic models. As I said before, the fact that they couldn't find a better model is not because they were not ingenious enough, but because there can't be any. There are also independent gravitational reasons for metastability. The observed cosmological constant is non-zero, how to make sense out of the sitter space Sitter space might be unstable. So that's a separate argument for metastability. There's a string landscape of vacua, which might be a separate argument for supersymmetry. But all these, are, <coughs> these arguments are of totally different flavor than what I've been saying so far. My discussion so far was much more general. I don't assume anything about gravity. I don't think anything about the cosmological concept. I assumed only particle physics. Having the same conclusion from the two different points of view, they kind of reinforce themselves. So we live in a metastable state, but I think there's no reason to panic. No, relatively stable. How common is that? For the, for the next several slides, I'll give some examples of metastable supersymmetry breaking. The purpose of them is to argue that the situation with metastable supersymmetry breaking is generic. So what all we really need is approximate R symmetry. And once we have approximate R symmetry, supersymmetry is spontaneously broken in a metastable state. 
And the first example to study is the most generic standard benchmark, if you wish. Gauge theory, which is supersymmetric UCD with NC colors and NF flavors, a theory that I've constantly been struggling with. So here is a review of some n equals 1 dynamics. The pioneering work on the subject was done by Venezianio and Yankelevich, and since then there are thousands of papers literally about this theory. It's a supersymmetric version of ordinary QCD. It has NC colors, NF flavors. We give the flavors masses. The Witten index tells us that supersymmetry is unbroken. There are NC ground states. We characterize the theory by some order parameter M, like a gauge invariant order parameter, like a quark bilinear, quark bilinear. And we have some vacuum. In fact, we have, we have NC vacua here in which supersymmetry is unbroken. As we turn off the masses and we consider the massless theory, the situation depends on how many flavors we have. If there are fewer flavors than colors, then the theory doesn't have a ground state. A potential like that, which slopes to zero at infinity, is generated. This is actually a prototype of a phenomenon which is very common in string theory, that the theory doesn't have a stable ground state, but they've run away to infinity. If the number of flavors is larger, the vacuum degeneracy of the classical theory is not lifted, and we have a moduli space of inequivalent supersymmetric ground states. Let's examine that in a little bit more detail. Imagine we have n quarks, and we give them masses. So we denote the quarks and the antiquarks by Q and Q tilde, and we turn on mass term, little m, multiply this bilinear, which we denote by big M. Gagino, if the mass is very large, we can forget about the masses, about the quarks, integrate them out. And the low energy theory is a few gauge theory, SUNC, super young mills. And the expectation value of M is obtained by, second, by a certain derivative with respect to mass of some super potential, which is a function of little m. For simplicity, let me set all the masses to be equal. This is a simplification I'll assume throughout this talk. And that gives the expectation value of this order parameter in terms of some fractional power of the mass. Lambda is the QCD scale of that theory, of la like lambda QCD. The important thing is that the exponent here flips sign depending on whether NF is bigger or smaller than NC. If NF is bigger than NC, which will be the subject of this talk, we notice that the exponent here is positive. So as I turn off the mass, as little m0 goes to 0, the order parameter goes to the origin where the theory is strongly coupled. So in this talk, we'll focus on what happens when the mass is small but non-zero. In that limit, it's clear that whatever is going on happens at extreme strong coupling where the theory is very non-perturbative and very interesting. Let me give a review of the talk I gave here in 94. In this range of number of flavors and colors, the theory has two inequivalent descriptions. I'll refer to as electric description and magnetic description which involve two different gauge fields, two different gauge groups. The flavor symmetry is the same. These are the quarks. They're in the fundamental of the gauge group. The antiquarks are in the antifundamental. And they transform somehow <coughs> under the flavor symmetry. The magnetic theory has quarks and antiquarks and neutral fields phi, which are gauge invariant. They transform under a different gauge group, SUNF minus NC, which are referred to as the magnetic gauge group. And they also transform under the flavor symmetry. We also postulate a superpotential, a tree-level superpotential here. Now, this theory and that theory are asymptotically free for different numbers of flavors and colors. This one is for number of flavors less than three times the number of colors, and this one is when the number of flavors is larger than three half of the number of colors. So I'll be in a region which is smaller than that, when this theory is not asymptotically free. We'll see the distinction soon. So these two theories are classically different. But it turns out that the two quantum theories are equivalent. The two quantum theories are equivalent, even though they are classically different. And that happens differently depending on how many flavors and colors we have. If the number of flavors is in the first region, between 3 half NC and 3 NC, both theories are asymptotically free. So they become strongly coupled as we flow to the infrared. The scale lambda is a crossover scale between the free UV theory and some interacting IR theory. The same is true in the electric description. These two points are different. These are the free UV theories. They are different, the electric and the magnetic one. 
but they flow to the same non-trivial superconformal field theory in the infrared. <coughs> Conversely, the number of flavors is larger than the number of colors, which is less than three half the number of, of colors. Then the electric theory is asymptotically free, so it becomes strongly coupled as we flow to the infrared. And around this crossover scale, big lambda, it changes behavior, and we end up with a magnetic theory, which is infrared free. This is a much more satisfying situation because we formulate physics here, at short, the problem is in physics at short distance, and we read off the answer at long distance, which is here. So this is the question, this is the answer. So the magnetic theory gives us a weakly coupled description of the answer, the weakly coupled description of the dynamics. So as I said, it is infrared free in this range of number of flavors, and it gives us an effective description at low energies, an effective description which is not asymptotically free, but it has an, a UV cutoff lambda. So this crossover scale lambda should now be interpreted in the infrared as the UV cutoff of the theory. So let's review this theory in a little bit more detail. It has a superpotential which I postulated, this one. I claim that this field phi is related to the meson M through the fact that the meson is the bilinear. It's essentially this field phi. And there is a Kähler potential in the infrared. And if the theory is free, the Kähler potential is approximately canonical. This is the key fact in this whole seminar, that we have control over the Kähler potential. If we didn't have control over the Kähler potential, we could not analyze supersymmetry breaking. That's a very important point to stress. We don't know these dimensionless numbers alpha and beta, the kinetic terms, but we have an expansion around, an ex analytic expansion of K around the origin, where we know the functional form except these two dimensionless parameters. So we'll keep these dimensionless parameters, which we don't know free, and we'll compute everything as a function of these dimensionless parameters. So I mentioned here that we can rescale some fields and move the our lack of knowledge about alpha and beta from one place to the other, but there are always two dimensionless numbers we don't know how to compute. So let's see how we understand in the magnetic language the supersymmetric vacua. So for generic values of M, the superpotential, this Q tilde phi Q, phi is non if M is proportional to phi, if phi is non-zero, it gives masses to the little Qs. The magnetic works are massive and heavy, and they can be integrated out, then the low energy theory is just the pu gauge magnetic gauge group. It can be integrated out. Again, it has gluino condensation in that gauge group. Leading to this term, we solve for the equation of motion of big M from this equation, and we find NC supersymmetric vacua, their expectation value of M that comes from this equation, which agrees with what we find in the electric description, although the physics appears to be totally different. However, when we examine the situation near the origin more carefully, we see that supersymmetry is broken there. So I'm going to turn on these masses M0. These are small masses, small than, smaller than the scale lambda of the theory. So this would be my expansion parameter, epsilon. And in the magnetic description, we have this three-level superpotential that we put in by hand. And now the masses are represented by another term, which is proportional to trace phi. This theory breaks supersymmetry. This is like an Orafferty model. And one way to see that is to differentiate that with respect to phi. So the derivative of the superpotential with respect to phi is this expression with various indices, color and flavor indices. In order for that to be, for, in order for supersymmetry to be unbroken, this has to vanish, but there's no way to, for this to vanish because the C is the color index, F and G are flavor indices. This matrix is really of rank NF minus NC, whereas this is a unit matrix of rank NF there is no way to set them equal to each other. So supersymmetry is spontaneously broken. And that's good news because we've already found the NC ground states that we need for the duality to be true. We already found them elsewhere using a geno condensation. So this was a test of the duality. What's more interesting about this test, okay, so this is a test telling us that near the origin we don't find extra vacua which would invalidate the duality. But in addition to that, it's also good for supersymmetry breaking. Because if we examine the low energy theory near that point, we find that there is a good ground state, locally stable ground state, which breaks supersymmetry. The phi field vanishes at the ground state, and these magnetic quarks get an expectation value. In fact, since the magnetic quarks are charged under the flavor symmetry, this point is not unique. It's not a single ground state. 
because they're massless Goldstone bosons. So we have a whole manifold of round states with this pattern of symmetry breaking. So what's the spectrum? We have an exact, exactly massless Goldstone bosons parametrizing this coset space. There's one exactly massless Goldstone fermion because supersymmetry is spontaneously broken. There are also various extra massless moduli which come from these other fields which are like, which are some of the components of Q and phi. In addition, there's a whole rich spectrum of, spectrum of masses of particles which are calculable all in terms of these two dimensionless parameters. So we can compute many order, many expectation values of order parameters, masses of particles, and so forth as a function of only two dimensionless numbers. There's a point here which is worth emphasizing. The pattern of global symmetry breaking that we see here is very non-standard. This theory does not have any chiral symmetries. It has only vector-like symmetries because the, everything is massive. And yet, global vector-like symmetries are spontaneously broken in this ground state. There are various, there's a lore that tells us that this cannot happen in quantum field theory. There are even rigorous theorems that tell us that this cannot happen. And yet, it happens in this example. The technical reason it happens in this example is that some of these theorems do not apply when they are, mass, when they are fundamental scalars. And here we have fundamental scalars. But more conceptually, the reason the various theorems that not do not apply is that we are in a metastable state. And various rigorous theorems about quantum field theory are about the ground state. We are not in the ground state. We are only in a very long-lived state. And various theorems are just not relevant there. So this is a very mysterious uh, ground state. And if we think of it intuitively, it's even more bothersome. Because this is a theory with massive quarks, very much like ordinary QCD. Yet it has condensates, which break barrier number and kind of isospin. And intuitively, how can such a thing be true? And the point is that we are really in a very strong coupling region where the mass is very small. The mass will be viewed as a perturbation, and it triggers the spontaneous breaking of the vector symmetries, as counterintuitive as it might sound. But supersymmetry is dynamically restored. Let me just review the argument again. The masses, if we go to very large fields, the masses of these quarks becomes very large. The magnetic quarks is very large. They can be integrated out. The genome condensation generates such a superpotential. And supersymmetry is restored at some large values of the fields. However, near the origin, the effect of this term is negligible because the exponent here, this is a determinant, it's nf by nf divided by nf minus nc. And for that range of nf and nc, the exponent here, this whole exponent of phi, is bigger than 3. So near the origin, this is a negligible contribution. So near the origin, we can ignore this term. And the previous analysis for supersymmetry breaking is correct. So everything is, again, driven by this small parameter epsilon, which we take to be much less than 1. It allows us to analyze the effects near the origin. We find supersymmetric ground states very far from the origin, of the order of epsilon to a negative power, but yet much smaller than the UV cutoff, which is lambda. So we have complete control over all the effects. And in various regions in field space, different terms are the dominant ones, and they lead to different physics. So this is a cartoon summarizing where we are. We have this field phi goes all the way to infinity. The cutoff of the magnetic theory is somewhere here, very far. <coughs> Even fur further to the right, the electric description is relevant. But we are where the magnetic description is good. Far below the UV cutoff, we see NC supersymmetric ground states. And near the origin, far, far closer here than where we are here, we find metastable states in which supersymmetry is broken. So, here is where supersymmetry is broken. Here is where we found this bizarre pattern of global symmetry breaking. Here is where we can compute the spectrum with this various, <coughs> various large hierarchy of scales coming from the various phenomena. And the potential goes up and up until this guy kicks in. When this guy kicks in, it curves the potential down to the supersymmetric ground states here. And then the potential goes up and connects to the electric theory. The cartoon here is not very good in the sense that the region up here is really very flat and very long. And I'll come back to that later. 
So even if you're not interested in supersymmetry breaking, you're just a quantum field theorist, this is a very interesting and surprising result that we take a quantum field theory, kind of a garden variety quantum field theory, just like ordinary QCD, and it exhibits these behaviors. First of all, in the previous slide, I had this complicated potential with various regions, with various features, with different scales, and many different scales in the effective potential. <coughs> Furthermore, the potential I drew on the previous slide had only one dimension, but this is really a multi-dimensional problem with all these magnetic quarks and so forth, and most of the features in the potential are in directions which are not even visible semi-classically. The features are in directions which do not correspond to any fundamental fields. These are directions involving the magnetic quarks, which are non-local with respect to the electric degrees of freedom. And yet, these complicated order parameters exhibit this rich phenomena. So it involves directions in field space which do not even have a semi-classical meaning. And as I stress, the pattern of global <coughs> symmetry breaking in spectrum at the metastable state or states violate general argument about quantum field theory, but there's no contradiction here. We should really make sure that our metastable state is very long-lived. That's relatively easy to ensure. As I said, we really have the complete control over the potential in this region because everything here is much below the UV cutoff lambda. We know the order of magnitude of the various, the height of the potential and the width. We have a small parameter epsilon which controls all the approximations, so we can compute the lifetime of the false vacuum. The decay probability is e to the minus the bounce action. And even though the scale of supersymmetry breaking of v, the vacuum energy in the metastable state is of the same order of magnitude but smaller than the height of the peak, and therefore we cannot use the thin wall approximation, we can still use the semi-classical approximation to estimate the bounce action. And that's basically the width of the potential to the fourth divided by the vacuum energy. The, in general grounds, the, ex, the bounce action has to be dimensionless. There's no dimension in the answer, in the exponent. So it has to be a power of epsilon. There's nothing else that can be there. So there might be a number of four to one, and the power of epsilon is easily determined. And it is, and this bounce action is much bigger than one, so this state is very long-lived. <coughs> it's parametrically long-lived. I put here in red, a comment which for some reason is not being emphasized in the literature, although it's intuitively clear. When we discuss metastable states, it really makes sense to discuss metastable states only when we have a small parameter which guarantees the longevity. It makes no sense to say that we have a metastable state without having a small parameter that controls the, the longevity of the state. Because having just a state, if you have such a potential like that, the state, the state decays, and you, or in other words, it's very hard to make rigorous sense of a metastable state. Uh, in quantum mechanics, it's possible. In quantum field theory, it's a lot harder. What we can do instead is make approximate sense of metastable states by approximating it, the first perturbation theory around the metastable state and maybe the leading exponential correction associated with the decay, but if we try to describe it exactly, <coughs> it's very, very difficult and probably doesn't make much sense. For that, to, for this whole story to be meaningful, we really must have a small parameter that controls the approximations, and fortunately we have it here. I'd like to spend a few more slides on particle physics applications and cosmology. So what do we do with these models? So in the old days, we wanted to break supersymmetry, and we would take such a model that breaks supersymmetry and use it as a module in a bigger theory. So that supersymmetry breaking is communicated from this module to the rest of physics, say to the MSSM, using with messengers or without messengers or with gravity mediation and so forth. So the first thing to do is take any of the model, kind of off-the-shelf models of supersymmetry breaking and mediation and replace the module which breaks supersymmetry with this one. That by itself is already progress, because before, as I stressed at the beginning of this talk, there were only a handful of models that break supersymmetry. Now we have tons of them. So we can put that in, and it's relatively easy. Second, some of the notorious questions in model building, especially in low energy scale of model building, low energy scale of supersymmetry breaking, receive a new perspective. And I made a list here, the question of the R symmetry and its breaking, this has been one of the notorious questions in model building. Now we say we just made peace with it. 
the asymmetry is an approximate symmetry. In fact, we use it to our advantage. Naturalness, the new problem, that new perspective in the Lando polls, I don't have much time to discuss it. Every one of these questions need to be re-examined, and again, with new perspective. The asymmetry, which I really emphasized at the beginning of the talk, appears to be an organizing principle in this model building, in constructing models. So just to review some of the facts and mention a few new ones, <coughs> If we have an exact asymmetry which is spontaneously broken, we typically break supersymmetry, we can get the genome masses, but we have a massless R axion which is possibly dangerous. If we have a small field theoretic explicit breaking, we have metastable vacuum. This option is what's very common in most of the models in the literature. There is also a possibility of having large explicit R breaking in the MSSM. But in the SUSY breaking sector, we have only an approximate asymmetry. There was some old literature about that, and these are recent papers <coughs> in the new context. Again, we have metastable vacuum, but here, in this, with this option, supersymmetry is broken at relatively high energies. There is also a possibility of organizing all the soft breaking terms using the R symmetry, in particular, emphasize the difference between the mu term and the B mu term, which carry different R charges. I don't have time to elaborate about that. Let me make a few comments about the cosmology. This mechanism for supersymmetry breaking leads to many new cosmological concerns or new perspective on old questions in cosmology, sorry, cosmological questions and new perspective on old cosmological questions. At very high temperatures, it's clear that the vacuum is near the origin because the potential curves up in all directions. But as the universe cools down, the second order phase transition happens. The universe cools down. And the question, real interest is, is the universe going to fall into the stable vacuum or to the metastable vacuum? Well, this group of people argued very convincingly and quite beautifully that the universe actually prefers to fall first into the metastable state. So as we cool down, we don't go to the stable vacuum, but we first go to the metastable vacuum. As we continue to cool down, there is a first order phase transition from the mana stable state to the stable one. It's clear because at very low energies, we must be at the stable minimum. But we are already stuck in the right place or the wrong place, depending on your point of view, with broken supersymmetry. So dynamically, the cosmological <coughs> evolution prefers the mana stable state in which supersymmetry is broken. So we don't have to tune where we are. We don't have to use any anthropic reasoning. There's good dynamical reasons to believe that we actually end up in this metastable state. Intuitively, the argument is very clear. The energy of the metastable state is higher than the energy of the stable state. But there are more massless particles in the metastable state. So it has more entropy. And that's why, at high temperature, the free energy of the metastable state is lower. And that's why we fall there. But at lower energy, at lower temperature, the energy wins over the entropy, and we fall to the lower ground state. I view that as extremely satisfactory, that even though we have stable and metastable sense and so forth, there's good dynamical reasons to pick the ground state rather than religion. What can, else can we do? Well, we can combine this story with inflation. I know that some people are looking into it. I alluded to the flat potential near the top of the potential. Maybe that could be used for something. Usually, it's very hard to find potentials which are non-zero, high, and very, very flat. Here it comes out automatically. I don't have anything concrete to say about that, but I would like credit if it's useful. So in conclusion, supersymmetry is a likely possibility to be discovered at the LHC to describe TeV physics. I think we should be thinking about it. Accepting matter stability leads to surprisingly simple models of supersymmetry breaking, much simpler than people used before. In fact, I argue that matter stability is inevitable, independent of all the gravitational slash stringy reasons for matter stability. There are good, completely field theoretic reasons for matter stability associated with the clash between breaking supersymmetry and therefore having an R-symmetry and not having an axion and having a genome masses. This clash between these two really points in, into metastability. 
Since dynamic metastable dynamical supersymmetry breaking appears in the first theory you examine, just supersymmetric QCD, there is every reason to believe that it's generic. In fact, by now we have lots and lots of other examples exhibiting the same phenomenon. So I would tend to conjecture that this is generic in field theory and generic in, in string theory, where it's usually very hard to find field theoretic descriptions of models with lots of vacua like that. The cosmology of this setup is extremely interesting and it poses new questions which I think should be explored. So what's our goal? We'd like to find a successful model of supersymmetry breaking and mediation for the observed world, a model that we can confront with the data that will come from the LHC. So hopefully it has distinct experimental signals, for example, patterns of super partners, super partner masses, which will be seen and tested at the LHC. And we don't have much time, because the LHC is coming online, so we should do it rather fast. So we should find it before the 61st birthday of Shimon and Eliezer. So happy birthday. Okay, thank you for pointing this out. <laughs> Where is Julius? The theorem which you are stating is, 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 is really excluding gravity. That's right. If you would take super gravity, of course, the story changes a bit because we know that the gravitino mass, if it is non zero, breaks the mass. That's because of the constant term in the superpotential. So, so if the constant term, that, that's a very good comment. Uh, the paper of Bagger, Randall, and Poppets uh, points out that if the, mod the field theory model that we discussed is an exact unbroken R symmetry, not, it could be spontaneously broken. In fact, it should be spontaneously broken to give gay genome masses. But if we have an exact R symmetry, there's a problem with what happens to the R axial, the Goldstone boson of this. Thing. And they pointed out that gravitational effects must break this symmetry explicitly. And an explicit example of that breaking is the constant term in the superpotential, which must be there, not so much for the gravitino bath, but for to set the cosmological constant to zero. Yeah, no, so the question is really whether this breaking is good enough or not. And depending on the range of parameters, the, ex the mass of, the gauge of this R axiom, which comes from the constant term in the superpotential, is within bounds or outside. For low scale supersymmetry breaking, it's not large enough to do the job. And you don't really need their detailed calculation to see that. All we are saying is that there is a mass for the axiom which is of order one over n Planck. And fix the dimensions, it has to be mass square, so you have to put the scale of the asymmetry breaking, divide by n Planck, that gives you the order of magnitude. It's just the fact that it's one over n Planck. There, there is a fact that there has to be a specific term there in order to set the cosmological constant to zero. So that sets that the coefficient is non-zero. Yeah. So I would say that gravity mediation in a certain way had solved these problems and still has solved it. Yeah, the and this question which is discussed now probably is a statement about models where the gravitino mass is small compared to the That's correct. Mass. That's correct. That correct. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. And I'm glad you brought that up. Gravity mediation has a lot of advantages, <coughs> but it also has many, many disadvantages. Now, some of the things I said can be used even with gravity mediation. Take this sector that breaks over symmetry, stick it there with a scale of say 10 to the 12, and use gravity mediation. Gravity mediation always had problems with how to get gay genome masses. We need to do anomaly mediation there, and then the, the scalars are too heavy. We don't have good reasons why the squarks are degenerate. There are many pr serious problems with gravity mediation. I like low energy gauge <coughs> mediation much better especially because it does not, it gives a natural solution to the flavor problem. And there are other reasons to believe that. Whatever I said in this talk was in the context of global supersymmetry. We send M Planck to infinity, and then I hope that what I said was correct. Mm -hmm. 
do this. Well, I just wanted to ask, uh, is there any measure of reason in this scenario that the supersymmetric breaking will be in the order of LMC? Well, I think there are other people here who are more knowledgeable than I am. But if we want the soft breaking terms to be in the hundreds of GeV, then the scale of supersymmetry breaking, the dynamics, uh, cannot be too low. Because in models with messengers, we have to pay various factors of alpha. Because if there's one loop to give it to the messengers, and then another loop of the messengers to, yes, to get it down. So it pushes to it to higher energies. It pushes the scale of supersymmetry breaking to be a little bit higher. In models of gauge mediation, it's typically about 100 TV or 1,000 TV or a little bit lower than that. I think Michael Peskin wants to correct me on that. But I'm still optimistic that what was called in the 80s direct mediation, where everything happens at as low energies as possible, uh, could still be done. Uh, I've spent a lot of time trying to think about that and couldn't come up with anything useful to say. But I think it would be extremely satisfying if it, at the LHC we find the super partners. I think you won't object to that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then at least we'll see signs that will tell us that supersymmetry is broken, say, within an order of magnitude of two. That would be nice. Now, you wanted to correct that, Michael? Uh, no, I wanted to ask you a technical question. So you have this impressive diagram of the metastable minimum that you Quark, which quark? Our quark or the? The original, the original quark in the supersymmetric. Ah, the, this is, you mean this generic model? This no, no, generic no, picture? No, no. Please go ahead. Just oh, go the one in the, in SUSE QCD. Yes. That, that okay, so what do you want to hold fixed? Do you want to, there's, there are two dimensional numbers, mass of the quark and lambda QCD. You hold one of them fixed, you call it one, and you send the other one that's to that's zero to so infinity. Yeah, this whole thing is squashed to the origin, and the height is squashed to the origin, and the longevity in that limit, see the longevity can, is a function only of m over lambda. This is the thing in the exponent, because as I stress, it must be dimensionless. And therefore it doesn't matter whether you think of it as fixed lambda sending m to zero, or fixed m sending lambda to infinity. The <coughs> words you use in physics are different. So I'll first describe yours, which is harder to understand intuitively. Okay. Lambda is very far, this is the cutoff, which is held fixed, it's one. And now we squash this whole thing to the origin. The thing which guarantees the longevity is that this becomes very small. It becomes very small in such a way that the metastable state is almost degenerate with the stable one. And they are separated by a tiny barrier. Now, as I said, the only thing that matters is the ratio between them. So I would rather think of it intuitively in the other possibility where the intuition is a lot clearer. In the other limit, lambda is sent to infinity, m is held fixed. Then this thing goes up, the barrier goes up, and the width becomes much larger, because this thing is shooting to, to the right. So then the barrier becomes bigger, and then it's more intuitive that, see, the formula for the exponent is basically the width to some power divided by the energy difference. Or this, this thing is of the same order of magnitude as the maximum. So this thing is always <coughs> the width to the power divided by the energy difference. That's, that's, the, crucial that's the crucial thing. So if you would say, uh, take supersymmetric QCD without the master, um, somehow the, the potential is always worth it. That's right. The behavior at infinity is, is a proportional to the mass square. As you know, that, at infinity you see it at three limits. <coughs> That's the nice thing about this. It's exactly what you learned in other models. It can be copied here. Between speed. Yeah. So there's an LSP, which might be the Gravitino, might be the Fortino, yeah, depending yeah, on the yeah, scales. The of R this time. That, that would not be. Larry. <coughs> well, first of all, I want to apologize. Oh, thank you. You should. <laughs> <laughs> What was the first? What? <laughs> 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 the first question is, what was it? I was apologizing. 
I don't want to repeat that, but I do remember that. <laughs> um, as a question of principle, just the kind of anal question that, uh, that this That is word was used in the talk when you were not. As a question of principle and definition, um, as you yourself said correctly, there doesn't seem to be any exactly well defined notion of an unstable state. Um, in fact, I think if you were to calculate using standard rules, for example, put this thing in a very large box. In a large box, you might look at uh, what's called the resolvent operator. The resolvent operator is a pool. Because some place in space that's right. That's right. The decay probability that I estimated here is the decay probability per unit volume, yeah. per unit time. Yeah. The because volume is infinite. Somewhere it's, it's going to pop. Right. Yeah. Um, so what is the definition of this thing? No, how do you define it? Okay, that, or that's or is, it, is it worth asking? It's, it's worth asking. I think it's worth trying to find a precise definition of a metastable state. I don't know one. Yeah, yet, no, in quantum mechanics, I have no problem. It's in field theory where I have a problem. Yeah. And I'm not the only one who struggles with that. And the thing which is so frustrating is it's very easy to create it in the lab. You know, yes. people in condensed matter do experiments about metastable state. But if the system is big enough, the lifetime is zero. Yes, but yet they can measure a lot of interesting physics. There are branches in condensed matter no, no, of that. There's super cooled water, you know, getting uh, rain and hail from the sky, all that uses metastable states, and yet, I don't know how to define it precisely. Well, could, it be better, could it be that when we add gravity and we think about the center space and so forth, that we do have a... Please don't make the problem more complicated than it is. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it, it's it No, I doubt it. I doubt it. This is a problem in condensed matter, in statistical mechanics. This is a problem in quantum field theory. I don't know the answer to Maybe you do. No. For resonances or for in quantum mechanics, there's really no problem. Just go to the second sheet, you find a pole, everything is great. In quantum field theory, I don't know the answer to this question. Tom looks like he knows the answer. Well, I don't know the answer in the sense that I can't prove what I have to say. There's a paper with my name on it, which is the claim with gravity for a certain class of potential, these metastable states make sense. But the people, I would really like to emphasize that people in condensed matter and statistical mechanics measure properties of metastable state. They run conferences on that. They're clearly measuring something correct. <laughs> what it is, Existing. I don't know. Yeah, it exists. Existing. It's much better than my metastable state here. Yeah, but, the, but they, they do the experiments with different things. Volumes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah
and negative in the stable one, I am greatly disturbed by it, but I don't have anything useful to, to say about it. Other questions? Well, if not, uh, we end perfectly in time. Thank you very much.